you got this topology information uh, and, and you've been poking at uh, these issues as to you know, why and what do I do with it. And the reason this is so important, again, is that uh, the underlying hardware system, you know, the physical system, has become very complicated. And errors in placement can make a, a huge difference in performance. And I, I will show some data. Um, and it's not simple. So even the models here, I mean, some of the, again, some of the comments that you were making was, say, skepticism about the value of this model because it's so um, simple. And I would say that skepticism is well placed. Uh, it's, this model is better than nothing. And uh, it points out the, or recognizes the need for doing these mappings. Uh, and it's better than nothing. Uh, but all of these models are approximate. Uh, there's a famous statement that all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, and it is, very, it is very true here, uh, both parts of that. So it's definitely wrong, but it might be useful. Um, even if it's not a perfect solution, it may be a better solution. Uh, and in some cases, there's a fairly um, uh, broad gap between where they are and where they should be. Uh, maybe another thing is you're thinking about designing codes A lot of what you read about designing parallel codes comes from an era where there was a much greater uh, homogeneity in the systems. That uh, there was a single processor per node. That processor had one core. All those terms made sense. You know, what is a core? Uh, on our big machine, we run into a constant problem of trying to define just that. You know, how many cores does it have in, on a chip? Well. Are we counting floating point units or energy units? And we get different numbers if I do that. Um, am I part of the marketing organization or the technical organization? We get different numbers of that. So um, the systems have just become much more complicated. And there are many levels of these hierarchy. Another uh, level that doesn't show up on some of the diagrams we've shown, if you've got multiple processor chips with multiple memory channels on the same node, then even though they may be able to share all of that memory across both chips, there may be a significant performance penalty across one. These are called like NUMA domains, so for non-uniform memory access domains. And then cross nodes, again, you get uh, a, uh, an effect. Um, if the, as the nodes are switched together, depending on where they are relative to other switches, you get other uh, sense of performance. So none of these things are going to be perfect, but they're going to, they're, an awareness of these is important. Um, you may be able to use MPI and some of these Cartesian, uh, or some of the topology creation routines to do better. Uh, but they also, it starts to give you, starts to get you thinking about the importance of doing the layout. Okay. Uh, and so we've also mentioned, uh, Things are just much more dynamic. And so there are all sorts of sources of these performance irregularities. It means that sort of mechanisms that used to work really well for dividing these problems up and putting them onto processors becoming less and less good. So even taking a regular grid and partitioning it across uh, the processes is not as good not as uh, effective a decomposition as it used to be, and more complex sort of unstructured de decompositions, these graph decompositions, uh, are even worse. Uh, and further, one of the things to note is if you go back and we talk about, say, I've got an unstructured graph, and how do I partition it? Look at what a, uh, a partitioner does, a graph partitioner. Uh, it takes a graph, and it's got some metric for deciding how to break the links across the partitions. Well, th that's a cost function. That cost function is wrong. <laughs> right? it's, it's a model. And it's uh, very simple. Uh, at best, there may be some weight on the amount of communication that's going over that line. That's not going to be very accurate, particularly if 
not all communication lines have the same performance. And in modern machines, they don't. We sh uh, Rajiv showed an example for a uh, uh, multi-process per node system where there were very different performance uh, numbers depending on where you were in the system. Right? Most of the partitioning software is unaware of that. Uh, even if it was aware, that cost model is always wrong. It may be close, uh, which is a reason why people can get away with it still, but it's still wrong. Uh, and another thing that we should note, uh, and in fact, Monday we saw these pictures, uh, he showed um, MPI performance, and there was all this time spent in all reduce, and all this time spent in wait all. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, that's not MPI time. <laughs> right? That's almost certainly load imbalance. You know, an all reduce waits because an all reduce can't finish until everyone has contributed data to it. Well, if anyone is late, everyone has to wait. And that makes the all reduce take up a lot of time. And I often hear people saying, I need a faster all reduce. And there are, this of course is like one person for whom that is in fact true. <laughs> right? But the other zillion people, what they need is a better balanced uh, code. Right? Right? Uh, one of the things that you can do, and you can do this, uh, so well, some libraries will do this for you. Um, it's actually pretty easy to do, making use of the profiling interface. How many people know about the MPI profiling interface? Ooh, okay. So every MPI routine exists with two names. There's the names we've been using, which is MPI underscore something. And then there is PMPI underscore something. Well, it, the MPI is designed so that PMPI is always what it says in the standard. So PMPI all reduce does an all reduce. MPI all reduce doesn't all reduce unless somebody writes a tool that says, I want to take care of this instead. And so one of the things you can do is you can write an MPI all reduce that does, inside does MPI W time, MPI barrier, MPI W time, MPI all reduce, MPI W time. And you can time how much time is spent in a barrier and how much time is spent in an all reduce that's executed after all the processes have gotten to the same point. Right. And if you find that most of your time is in the barrier, then you know that your application is not load balanced. Right. And you could do this without changing a line of your source code. All you have to do is link with this little uh, example. Uh, and some libraries will include options to do this. Some profiling tools will do this for you. Uh, it's a good thing to be looking for. And, and you will also see this, although it's a little harder to find, when you communicate. So if you do a halo exchange, there is a lot of implicit synchronization. I can't complete receiving until someone has sent me all the data. Right? So you need to be looking for those things. Uh, and you have to be prepared to respond to sources of uh, performance variation that you might not have expected. Okay, now here is an example of where uh, you might get a performance variation that's bigger than you might think. So uh, let's look at, again, uh, neighbors exchange, uh, well, let me look at communication on a mesh. Now this is not, let's think of this as not the MPI process mesh, this is the hardware mesh. So. This is a, a processor, and it's got wires to this processor, and it's got wires to this processor, like this. And then say I do a communication, and the MPI process that is on this processor needs to send to this MPI process that's on this MPI processor. Why is it sending there? That's how the, the processes got mapped to the processors. <laughs> Very important to keep these two things separate. Um, and that may just happen because the system you're on has a certain kind of mesh and your decomposition is not exactly the same. Okay. So why is that bad? Well, now 
let's let this process on this processor send to the process that's on this processor. Okay, well, problem is right here, both of those messages end up traveling over the same link. You know, sort of the nice thing about MPI and the underlying communication layer is all of this routing, you know, figuring out how to get from here to here is handled by somebody else. The problem is that if these messages are sent at roughly the same time, which, for example, for a halo exchange might be likely because in a halo exchange you do a bunch of computing and then you do your exchange, which means everybody is doing the exchange. And we saw the example this morning of the sign kind of uh, conflicts that one uh, can get with that. Ends up meaning that essentially these two messages are sharing the bandwidth on this one link means that the effective bandwidth is down by a factor of two. Okay? Not by 10%, it's down by a factor of two. Um, even though the rest of the links are all running at full speed, you get hung up every place that there is one of these, uh, con these this contention for the link bandwidth. Further, because so many of the parallel algorithms are so loosely synchronous, so, but they're still synchronous in the sense that I have a compute phase, and then a communication phase, and then a compute phase. During the communication phase, it's likely that uh, unless I can, I'm very, very careful only to send to my immediate physical neighbors, not my immediate logical neighbors, my immediate physical neighbors in the underlying hardware, this is likely to happen. And even worse, it only has to happen on one link for my communication to take twice as long for everybody because you, everyone else ends up waiting as a result of the dependencies between each of the processes. Right? So you know, there's a huge uh, impact for being just less than perfect. Right? So if I, have, if I have one of these, and I have 10 of them, it's still the same time. Right? One of them's all it takes to slow things down. Okay? And of course, I might have multiple processes rooting somehow so that they're going through the same place. And each one of those will then take that fraction uh, away. And the loosely think there is algorithms, the ones that have compute phases and communication phases, are more likely to do this because they concentrate the communication into a phase. That means that you're more likely to have them in the network at the same time when they can run into each other. Yeah. Um, for the first case where you know the uh, effective bandwidth is reduced, you know, has become half. Um, if there is congestion on that line, won't the network or I mean I'm not familiar with the right term, but won't the network or somebody say, oh, this is congested. Let's route the packets through somewhere else so that the effective bandwidth is not half but. So, so some systems will do that. Um, the, that's called adaptive routing. Uh, the problem is that those decisions are made locally. It's the only way they can be made. Um, and the, the consequence of that is things can get directed to make things, it can become even worse because as you route somebody things elsewhere, you may find that a whole bunch of people route things in the same direction and they sort of arrive um, because you know, it's like, well, it's like you're at rush hour and you see an exit ramp and you say, oh, this is great, I'll take the exit ramp along with you know, everyone else. <laughs> um, and so you get that problem. So some vendors use direct routing, which is, um, I, you know, no, you know, I just go there according to my route and I don't care, right? Um, uh, so yes, some systems will back off. You won't lose quite as much uh, and that might work as long as you're not doing too much communication. Again, one of the problems with the communication phase is that the whole network is getting filled up. Um, the, the, the chance is that there's no good place to reroute the message. And in fact, one of the ways to look at how likely this is to happen is to think about 
how many, for each of your messages, how many links in the network is it likely to be using? Add those up. If that number is greater than the total number of links in the network, you're doomed. <laughs> right? Because there's just no way. Um, and, so, and, and seriously, you can do that. And that often gives you a good insight about what your problem is. How do you fix that? Uh, well, um, you have to change your algorithm. That's one of the things that I want to be hinting at. One of the ways you might change your algorithm is you might uh, expand out the amount of time over which the data is moving, uh, which means that essentially the number of link time units increases. It gives more time for the messages to arrive. So one of the things you can do there is instead of doing a compute phase and a communication phase, is you can start a communication phase, do some, comp some computation, progress a communication phase, do some computation, and so forth. By smearing out the communication, you may both reduce the likelihood of the sort of collision on the links, and by increasing the amount of slack time between when you send and when you need to receive, uh, decrease the impact of any slowdowns. Now, of course, that's a lot of change to the algorithm, right? So I'm not, in, I'm not encouraging you to start from scratch by thinking this way, but you need to be thinking defensively about what am I going to do if I discover that my communication is too slow? How am I going to reorganize my code? Or how am I going to think about my algorithm? And to what extent can I predict that I'm going to have a problem in advance? And I already mentioned one way to do that prediction is, to, is a sort of very crude but surprisingly effective model of just thinking about how many of the communication links you're going to be occupying versus how many you have. OK. Yes? So I'm not really a network person, but what if your data packets from both of those processors combined doesn't exceed the bandwidth of that channel? Don't you have to saturate it before it becomes? Yeah. Yeah. My assumption here is that I'm sending enough data that I'm filling all of those links, you know, that, you know, that there, a packet started coming here, and I just kept stuffing packets into here because I've got 64K of data. And so there's, if, if I drew this, it'd be dot, 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 dot of little packets flying through this network, right? Yeah, so that's a, another thing. If the, if the amount of data that you're sending is small, then you can get away with a, you know, a lot more of this. Now, one of the things to remember is that when you say, oh, I'm only sending, say, a word, there is no network on the planet where you send a word, <laughs> right? You all, there's always more data involved. You know, there's, there's a header, and then there's a little bit of payload. Uh, and in many networks, uh, particularly many very fast networks, uh, uh, it's another trade-off for speed, have fixed size units of things that they uh, move, sometimes called flits. Right? And that's the minimum size object. So you might think you're sending four bytes, but you're actually sending um, 48 or 64 or 128, even if most of it's empty. <laughs> Um, but then, but that will, you are sending that much and that will be filling up the link. Okay. Okay, so uh, I do have, you wanted some numbers, so I've got some numbers here. Uh, I have another code that does um, a halo exchange. It uses slightly larger data. It has a, a few more um, options to allow me to try different codes uh, or different exchange patterns. And I've run it on a, a couple of machines. Uh, I've got some older data I'll show here. These are um, the BGQ and the uh, Cray XE6. These were done um, last year. So I will say I expect these numbers are different today because <laughs> they do tend to change. Uh, and you'll see here, for example, um, on the, when I ran these in the BGQ, if I used the I receive and send pattern, the one I talked about this morning, I got a bandwidth of about you know, um, on the order of 700 megabytes per second. It's an aggregate for uh, an eight-neighbor exchange. If I used the I receives I sends, the thing I said to do, I got uh, somewhere between about 1,200 and 1,400 uh, megabytes per second, which is pretty good, although compared to the link bandwidth is depressing. <laughs> um, 
but uh, it's actually not bad because um, you have to get the data into it and out of it. Uh, one of the things to note here is that there's a big difference between um, uh, Com World and uh, this was just a communicator that was created by um, uh, putting the even ranks first, followed by the odd ranks. <laughs> right? That gave me uh, about a 300 megabyte per second benefit. Which was not bad. Um, I'd like to say that I would get that with cart create, but unfortunately I didn't. <laughs> um, it's one of the reasons why the communicator is such a great thing, because you can try cart create. If it doesn't work, you can replace it with something else, and you still have that communicator, and at the end, Having a communicator that's properly ordered is what you want. You don't care how you get it. You sort of, and then you complain to the vendor that cart create doesn't work right. <laughs> um, on the uh, on the cray, I got these numbers, uh, which I found disappointing. So about 300 megabytes per second, and there's a uh, fairly small difference. And then cart create didn't really make a difference. Now that was for a full Halo exchange. So it's all the processes are are communicating their halos, I would expect this to fill up the network. Right, so everybody's doing all this communication. So, uh, and in all cases, these numbers are lower than, uh, certainly than the hardware numbers. So those hardware <laughs> bandwidth numbers uh, should always be taken with uh, bags of salt, and not, Right. Whether it's the MPI performance or whether it's memory bandwidth, none of those things are mean almost anything. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that that's the usually the, that what they're putting is the burst bandwidth. In other words, once I get some data into the wire, how fast does it move down the wire? Well, that's such a tiny part of the total cost <laughs> that uh, it doesn't really tell you very much. Um, so. One thing to look at then is, okay, so if, if this is happening, is there a different experiment I can perform that will give me some insight into how fast the communication could happen in the absence of contention for the resource? So I did something very simple. It's, uh, as an experiment, it has an, quite a few flaws, uh, particularly on multi-core, multi-chip nodes, but let's ignore that. The idea was to pick some process in the middle have it send to its neighbors, so all of, in this case, all of its eight neighbors, have those neighbors receive it, and have everybody else stay quiet. So in a perfect system, this would give you uh, roughly, um, would give you essentially the performance you'd expect to get from everybody. Maybe twice the performance uh, because you're only sending data, you're not sending or receiving. And sending and receiving means that you've got to move data into your memory system and out of it. So when I did that, um, on the BGQ, I got uh, about 2.8 gigabytes per second, pretty close to double this, uh, which is um, reasonably nice. Uh, on the Cray, I got 5.5 uh, gigabytes per second, uh, so blowing this completely away. Um, but, of course, that's not what I'm getting on the application. The application is seeing this sort of stuff. Um, and it's uh, interesting, if a bit depressing, to look at the uh, historical history here. So I have data for uh, BGL, P, and Q. Uh, and um, these are uh, the numbers uh, sending to a single process. And I have the uh, XE3, XE4, and XE6. And what's interesting is to compute the ratio of these single process to doing the whole Halo exchange. And the argument is that these should be about, this bandwidth should be about twice because I'm uh, using half, the, uh, half of the link. And what I see is that for the blue genes, um, except for this one case here, um, the ratio is about a factor of two. Really what's happening here is IBM made uh, an effort to map the MPI communicators and the processes onto the mesh interconnect of the blue gene in a way that the logical neighbors were often the physical neighbors, <laughs> okay, almost always. Um, on the Cray, 
if you look at what they do for um, the process mapping, uh, they tended to use one of these space filling curves over groups of nodes that were allocated by a system that was trying to pack as much, uh, as, as many jobs as possible into the machine. Right. So the problem with the, with the IBM approach is it uh, can leave big fragments. Um, it, it's, first of all, you, there's a minimum size job that you get, uh, or a minimum, sorry, there's a minimum size some number of nodes that get allocated to your job, and no one else can use those even if you weren't using them. So if you say, I want 16 nodes, you don't get 16 nodes. You get some, uh, some small block, and the rest of it just goes to waste. Um, and the cray, they would fill that in. Um, and the other thing is that the Cray is quite happy to give you a block here and a couple over here and a couple here so that you can now run now. Whereas uh, for the IBM model, it will wait until it give you one big block. But there's, so, you know, it's again, it's one of these things, though, which is the right approach? Okay. Uh, but there is a big consequence for what Cray does is you get these um, significant impact on the performance for these halo exchanges because the logical neighbors are not the physical neighbors. Right? And so here's an example. Um, and I'll also uh, say one lab um, did an experiment where they tried various uh, reorderings. And they said, well, it really doesn't matter. Of course it doesn't matter. If you do random reorderings, the likelihood that you're going to correct every single one of those uh, contentions is you know, that has probability zero. Right? So you're not going to find it by doing random tries. Right? You will only be able to avoid that sort of overlap uh, by having somebody, and you hope, the MPI implementation, but maybe it's you, figuring out how to map the processes onto the physical hardware. Right? And so what I hope you've seen from this is it really is a big deal. Um, you, you can do some analysis to figure out whether you need to worry about it. And so you know, if my application code was behaving like this and this communication phase was an important part of the overall job time, it would say it's probably worth it to figure out how to do the process to processor assignment to improve the performance, OK? Because in, in particular, doing this little model where, OK, let's assume that I've solved the contention problem by keeping everybody quiet. How fast would it then run? Well, I see on the Cray that I've got a uh, huge difference. This is all potential performance improvement that I could get by doing the appropriate remap. Uh, we've been on our system uh, down in Urbana, which is a big Cray system. We have been working with Cray, and this is getting, we're getting better and better at being able to help applications map even with complex communication patterns. So you might not be able to get rid of all of the uh, overlaps by two, but you might be able to reduce the maximum number of overlaps, which is another thing that you could do. And in fact, you can imagine finding out that if you can't get rid of all places where communications are sharing lines, it might, be, it might even be better to have more overlap if the total number of messages sharing a link is lower, right? Because you're, because of the synchronization, you don't care how much contention there is. You care what is the maximum amount of time that you've lost. Okay. So any questions? Yeah. Could this be done in the reverse order? I mean, you give to the, the ask partition, to the image partitioner the characteristics of the, of the hardware uh, the topology. And then the mesh partitioner can give you the most uh, appropriate partition for your mesh according to the, to the hardware? So you, um, you can do some of that. Um, uh, uh, Thorsten and uh, Mark Sneer have a paper where they've developed some heuristics for that. So the, the perfect mapping problem is NP. <laughs> So uh, it's very hard, but there are some nice heuristics. Uh, uh, heuristics, in fact, that are similar to what one uses for um, sparse matrix bandwidth reduction. Um, and that will give you an approximation. Um, and that's one thing you can do. And in, in fact, one of the things that uh, I'd like to see 
you know, some of those heuristics applied in, for example, implementation of MPI disk graph, because that's where you could take advantage of it. Um, you could use it in the partitioner in um, breaking up the graph. Now, again, its cost model is still too simple um, because the, like the edge weights, um, when you look at mapping the partitioning onto the hardware, the edge weights depend on the map because <laughs> it depends on how that edge gets mapped onto the hardware links. And the links don't have the same performance. And so it's not the, it's not the simple model that uh, partitioners have been designed around where there's a, 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 um, a, 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 a I don't know what's the right term for it. There's a closed form expression for the, uh, the cost. It's the problem is that the, the actual cost um, is, a, um, is a function that involves the partition. <laughs> right, so, you, so you could do a nonlinear optimization of it, of that function, but even then, the cost models uh, is a model. But yes, you know, that's something you should be doing. Okay, yeah. Uh, in your results, so comparing Blue Gene Q and Prey XC6, it doesn't the fact that one is a 3D torus and one is a 5D torus matter at all? Um, I, you know, I think it does. It makes it a little easier, um, if I go back here, it makes it a little easier. Um, the 5D torus gives you a little more flexibility in doing the map of the 3D torus, so the problem is easier. Um, but uh, uh, at the same time, the, um, the philosophy for how this mapping is done is different. In fact, they use a, uh, inside the blocks, uh, they were using a space filling curve, which also addresses, uh, I think, a question we got earlier, which is the space filling curve is good, but it leaves you with um, some of these uh, conflicts. Because right, things are close, but not close enough. So should we use something like reverse petal maquis or something for spot matrix you don't uh, to? That, so that's one of the, um, one of the approaches that uh, Heffler and Sneer used in the, uh, their paper. Yeah. Well, um, for the graph mapping, so yeah, so you could use that for the partitioning. Um, uh, it wasn't, I'm not sure I'm going to recommend it. It was not bad. <laughs> I, re I recommend the paper. The paper is fun. Um, I think you know this is an open research topic. It's a, it's a very hard problem. Um, this is why all of these systems, including BlueGene, provide mechanisms that allow you to control the placement of every single MPI process. So the, uh, on uh, the BlueGene queues here, you can give it a mapping file, and each line of the file says where the next rank goes. <laughs> And you can give the coordinates of the process. Um, and you can do this, the same thing can be done on the Cray. Um, because in the end, sometimes you need to do that. And, and it can make a huge difference. So if you're a developer, you should keep this information outside your code, I guess. Because with Cray, you do it in AP run and with. Yeah. So you should just try to abstract it away. I guess it's not good to write it into your code. Right. Well, so, so the best, yeah. So this is another place where, again, it's really good not to write your code around MPI com world because one of the ways that you might fix it. So um, on the Cray, the challenge is um, because you don't get a, a cube of nodes, it's hard to uh, know exactly what to say at runtime or at job submission time. So one of the things you can do is say, don't even give me the job until I've got these nodes. And we have people who run that way. <laughs> um, but that, of course, lengthens the time you have to wait until you can run it all. So one of the things you should think about is, well, can I do something with what I've got? <laughs> um, and so there are things you can do at runtime. You can find out what is the physical layout. So um, uh, both of these systems have got routines that allow you to get the physical information you know, which processor am I on? Which core am I on? And at that point, you could also try to create a better communicator. Uh, you know, in other words, one whose ranks were laid out in a way that was going to be convenient for what you were then going to do with them. So um, again, being flexible about when that information is available. You might have to do it as you get started. You know, at, at job submission time, you may have to do it 
at runtime dynamically. Uh, on some of these systems, uh, we have some users on the Cray who will uh, ask for an extra couple of nodes, an extra couple of ranks, and if those rank, and then if there's a couple of processes that are poorly cited, <laughs> they may just eliminate them right? or use them for auxiliary tasks. You know, so for example, say you had a job and you want to use some nodes, a couple nodes for doing I.O. and the rest of the nodes for doing compute. At runtime, you could figure out which were the nodes to do the I.O. Those would be good nodes that were sort of out on the edge someplace. And then the nodes for doing the computing and communication would be ones that had uh, uh, good connectivity with each other. Yeah? Do you know of any papers where somebody has used a nonlinear optimizer uh, optimization algorithm to try and do the mapping? No. It doesn't mean that there aren't any, but off the top of my head, I... I, I was trying to look for one before. I yeah. Um, yeah, although there's some people we could, we should ask. There's, I would, there are some people at Argonne who might be looking at that. So I would ask some of the Argonne colleagues to uh, try to connect you with the optimization group. There are a number of other routines that have been added to MPI to help in doing these sorts of uh, communication operations and to give the MPI implementation more opportunities to provide good performance. Um, I'm putting that sort of in the future tense. So these are fairly new things. They were added in MPI 3. Uh, they're available in, for example, the MPI CH implementation. Uh, I think it will still be a little while until the implementations take full advantage of what they have. Um, but uh, they give you a nice way to express some fairly common uh, operations. So what the neighborhood collectives are is essentially the communication uh, counterparts to the topology routines. Because the topology routines, all they do is, is effectively renumber the ranks in the communicator and provide a little bit of additional information so that you can say, who are my neighbors under the topology that I defined? So if I define the Cartesian uh, topology, I can ask, Who's the process on the left? And it will give me the rank in that communicator. So what the neighborhood collectives are, are communication routines that work with the topology that you may have created. Uh, and uh, it provides um, some sort of um, convenient way to do, in particular, um, halo exchanges. So in fact, on one machine, a long time ago, one of the fastest ways to do a halo exchange was to call MPI alt all V, uh, where V meant that you could send a different size message to everybody. Most of the messages were of size zero, but the immediate neighbors weren't. And it turned out that because of some hardware features on this machine, that was a blindingly fast way to do a halo exchange. Um, uh, as you can tell, at that time, the machines were much smaller, so having, there weren't a lot of extra zeros in that uh, description. These neighborhood collectives give you know, a much cleaner way to do it. And sometimes these were called sparse collectives to go along with this idea of having uh, an all-to-all -all that is not, in fact, all-to-all. -all. It's, it's everyone who is my neighbor, right? I'm going to send a different, all, it's a neighbor all-to-all -all, sends a different message to all of my neighbors, not all of my processes in the communicator. That's the difference. And that's why these are called the neighborhood collectives. Okay, so um, there are Cartesian neighborhood collectives. So that gives me um, my direct neighbors, so uh, not the diagonal ones, the up, down, left, right, whatever. Um, and the uh, there, the, the data is laid out in um, uh, sort of the canonical um, order, defined by the order of dimensions, um, you know, left then right or down then up, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and you can, um, uh, the, 
if you're if you're not periodic, the places where you would have an NPI proc null, there's just um, uh, uh, a hole left in the, in the buffer. So all the buffers have sort of the same layout. You know, it doesn't change depending on whether you've got an MP, you've got a uh, you're at the edge or not. Okay, and so you can do um, things like uh, all gather. Uh, to get the data from um, all of your neighbors, um, and you can do uh, an alt. You can do this all to all. Now, instead of having to do an alt to all v with lots of zeros, your disk graph create or your cart create has essentially created the sparse pattern and efficiently encoded it. And the neighborhood collectives can make use of that. Um, there are also ones for uh, well. These work with any communicator which has a topology, so it means it works with ones that have a graph, um, and uh, the order again is determined by the order um, that uh, is returned by um, either graph neighbors or disk graph neighbors. It works for with both the old and the new uh, graph routines. Um, uh, in this case, the, the distributed graph um, is directed, so you can send different amounts of data in each um, direction. And in fact, because it's an arbitrary graph, it's a set, effectively you can set up any sort of persistent communication pattern like this. Uh, now, there's been a fair amount of research on how you optimize those sorts of things. So, for example, um, this morning I pointed out that <clears throat> if I was really careful, and I did that uh, MPI I receives, and I did MPI send, 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 send. If those sends were careful, and the send, only the send downs worked in the send down time period. And a process that didn't have a send down was just quiet. Then that loop would also have only taken four steps. <laughs> it didn't take, it took more because some people got ahead and then interfered with other processes. So one optimization strategy uh, that has been used in the past and can still work is to organize the communication so that there is less uh, conflict as things happen. And in fact, uh, we did say, and we're right to say, that you should take, you know, you shouldn't use MPI barrier. As with almost everything else we've said today, there's a little asterisk. <laughs> the asterisk is that if the following two things are true, your barrier is really, really fast, and it might be really, really fast because there's special hardware to support it. And by placing the barriers in just the right places, you can prevent some communication from interfering with other communication. Adding a barrier can speed the code up. And you, will, you may find some codes where barriers have been put in, and at the time they were put in, the code was made faster. So one of the, it, one of the why, why do I say all this? Well, partly is because some of you, a lot of you are working with legacy codes. You might see such stuff. I want to warn you that while in many cases the barriers are unnecessary and performance sucking, there are a few cases where they're in fact useful. Right. So bear that in mind. But the other reason I say it is that a neighborhood collective it's collective. It means that the MPI implementation has a huge amount of information, not only about what that process is doing, but about the other processes. And so in principle, an implementation can take advantage of that to improve the performance. Now, as I said, we're not there yet. <clears throat> but what I expect to see uh, over the next couple of years is people taking advantage of that. Another thing is that. This is not a bad abstraction. So you could decide to use a neighborhood collective. If you discover that it's not giving you the performance you want, the right fix might be to think about it this way. Take advantage of the information you know because it is collective to help schedule the communication, order it so that it's more efficient. And then use that abstraction as a way to think about it. Okay, these routines are um, fairly um, straightforward. So here, for example, is all gather. So we've got uh, the usual triple. 
a buffer account, a data type, and we've got the receive buffer account and a data type, and the communicator. You don't have to special, specify the topology information because it's all contained within the communicator already. So it looks very much like a regular um, all gather. Uh, all to all, again, pretty much the same way. Um, sends uh, out degree messages, takes in degree messages, so the graph is directed, uh, and this reflects that. Um, and there are um, versions of this, uh, so in this case, um, uh, with alt all, the count is the same for all the messages. Um, there are versions where the count can be different for each of those messages. And non-blocking versions of these. And so I can do a non-blocking halo exchange with a single MPI call. Right? So that would be another, if you're really adventurous, that would be another example that you could use as a replacement for the exchange routine um, in you know, today's sample code. Um, uh, and it, ha it also behaves as, a, as, the non as another non-blocking collective, which means um, unlike point-to-point, -point, where a non-blocking receive can be matched with a blocking send, um, the non-blocking collectives have to be matched only with non-blocking collectives. You can't match you know, an I all, uh, an I neighbor all gather with a neighbor all gather on some other process. So same sort of uh, model. Um, they have to be ordered in the same way that the collectives do. Okay, so the topology functions, um, I think maybe the most important thing here is it's important to think about this topology. Whether or not you use the MPI tools to work with it, it's very important to think about it, if you're, particularly if you're looking at scale. So on a, a small machine, much of this doesn't matter because your network's almost flat, almost everything is connected to everything else. Um, few of these things come about. But as you get larger and larger, you're more and more likely to have uh, uh, a mismatch in the mapping of your processes onto the physical hardware such that the communication links are no longer uh, to your immediate neighbors. And as soon as that starts to happen, you can get these significant slowdowns in performance because you're sharing these communication links. So that's the big message. MPI has a bunch of topology routines that may be sufficient uh, to solve the problem. Uh, and in some cases, they should be. And if they're not, you should complain to the vendor. Um, in other cases, uh, it gives you uh, an abstraction that, if necessary, you can replace. OK. Um, I will say, you know, an another thing that comes up is, well, why doesn't MPI just tell me about the network topology? Well. Uh, if you can propose something to me, to the MPI forum, that uh, will still be good in 20 years for the network topology, <laughs> like send receive, um, uh, you know, we'll take you out to eat for the, you know every day for the next month. Um, it's a very very hard problem. Um, I've seen a number of proposals for such uh, such an interface, and almost none of them has still been valid a year later. <laughs> because right, something else changes in the network where there's something else that you need to know. Um, so it's really inappropriate for MPI to standardize that. However, that doesn't mean the information is not available. Uh, it just means that you're going to have to go figure out for the systems that you work on how to get that information. And most systems will give that to you somehow. Um, and if you're interested, I can show you how you get it on um, on. Vesta and Mira, and how you can get it on the craze. Um, okay. Yeah, right. And then the neighborhood collectives are a nice thing that works with the topology. Again, they may be what you want, or this abstraction might be a good way for you to be thinking about the problem. Um, you've got uh, all gather, you've got all to all. All to all is a halo exchange. So basically, everybody is sending the appropriate data to. Their, part, their neighbors' go cell regions. Um, and 
potentially um, there could be a, a very good optimization potential here. Uh, we'll see. Okay. And then finally, um, particularly for the, uh, the last couple of these slides, a lot of the work on the neighborhood collectives was done by uh, Torsten Heffler and uh, Pavan Belagy uh, contributed a number of the RMA slides. We'd like to thank them. Are there any questions? Yes. If I was going to volunteer something. Um, uh, so Livermore did have a project where uh, it's what we call LDRD, where uh, we had a summer student now working on this and team working on doing some efficient mapping. Um, and so uh, if I recollect correctly, we basically had a mesh generator that would give us a domain adjacency graph for these mesh graphs and then the machine mapping for BGQ and use Scotch to efficiently map it. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody had any questions on that, the PI on that was uh, Abhinav Patel. Ah, yes. and you can you can Google Chizu space topology and find it out on Google. So yeah. if you're going to want to try to write a tool, they, they have a lot of lessons learned. Good, thank you.